Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Jennifer Wright and I am excited to welcome you to our call to action webinar addressing uh, opioid related harms in our community. Our presenters will be discussing the effect of opioids in our communities as well as strategies for improving medication safety. <clears throat> this is also the kickoff for our medication safety campaign. So be on the lookout for webinars, tools, resources uh, related to opioids, diabetic agents, and blood thinners. Uh, CMS regards these three medication classes as posing the highest risk in our communities, and so has made them a focus for intervention and improved safety. Uh, while I run through a couple of housekeeping items, if you would please introduce yourself in using the chat feature, and um, we're asking that you tell us your name, title, and where you work. So while you're doing that, I want to let you know a few things. Um, there will be Nevada Nursing CE available for this webinar. Um, and for those of you that are joining us just by phone and not able to be a part of the webinar piece, the slides will be available for you along with a recording after the webinar on the website and we'll give you that information towards the end of the call. Um, so. Thank you all for chatting in. I see those flying by. Um, now that you've introduced yourself using the chat and you have an idea of where it is, uh, we're hoping that you'll feel comfortable to use it throughout the presentation. We will not have an option for asking questions by phone. We're going to ask that you put all of your questions into chat. And we do have Tyler Havlin and I here in the room. Uh, monitoring that chat to ensure that we catch all of your questions and we will compile them for the speakers. Good. We're typing it to all panelists. It needs to go to all panelists and attendees. There's an option to. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, Tyler, just let me know. There's a, a drop down box at the right above where you type on the chat window. And it looks like a lot of you are typing just to the panelists, which means I can see it just fine, but the other attendees cannot. So as going forward, um, that drop-down box, you can choose two panelists, two all panelists and attendees. So that's where you're going to want to put your questions and chat. Thank you, Tyler, for that catch. So as you can see, we are monitoring the chat, and um, we're excited that you're here with us. For those of you that don't know who Health Insight is, uh, we are a private not-for-profit uh, community-based organization and we're dedicated to improving health and healthcare. We're composed locally of um, organiz governed organizations, or locally governed rather, excuse me, organizations um, in the four western states. We coordinate with health systems and we develop and apply strategies for delivering safer and more effective care. We hold several different contracts um, including those such as this one, um, which is with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and we are called a Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization, or a QIN QIO, uh, and we are that entity for these four states, Oregon, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. This current contract runs uh, from 2014 through 2019, so we're pretty much smack right in the middle of it. Um, we also hold other types of contracts such as uh, National Institutes for Health and Association for Healthcare Research and Quality um, Opioid Safety Research Grants um, and others like that. So again, to help familiarize you with the different pieces of the webinar that we're going to use today, we're going to do a polling question. And um, what we'd ask is that you fill out this poll and again just give us an idea of who our audience is and um, this way our speakers will know because they were not likely able to read the chat quickly that quickly and while you do that I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers Dr. Jerry Reeves is the Senior Vice President of Medical Affairs at Health Insight. Um, he is responsible for clinical oversight and guidance for the work performed at Health Insight. He also chairs the Nevada Partnership for Value-Driven Healthcare, um, Health Insight Nevada's Regional Health Improvement Collaborative, 
and ARC designated charter value exchange. Outside of Health Insight, Dr. Reeves does national consulting on various health benefits design, wellness, and health management services for health plans, sponsors, and coalitions. Dr. Nicole O'Kane is a pharmacist and is the clinical director of Health Insight Oregon. She works directly with providers and pharmacists across the healthcare setting, across healthcare settings to provide leadership and help improve coordination of care for people taking high-risk medication combinations, including opioids and other controlled substances. Currently, she is a leading member of two naloxone work groups in Oregon, working to develop effective policies and regulations around prescribing and dispensing naloxone at the pharmacy level. And she also serves as a co-investigator on the ARC-funded project to develop and evaluate a toolkit aimed at community pharmacists to facilitate the use of prescription drug monitoring program and enhance supportive, effective communication between patients, pharmacists, and prescribers around opioid management. So now that I've introduced our speakers, I'm gonna end this poll and we will share the results. Thank you all for voting. You can see that we have a really nice mix in our audience. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited about this, this uh, presentation. All right, read quick, moving on. Um, today, you're going to hear about these, uh, or we're going to cover these objectives. Our plan is that Dr. Reeves will start us off by describing the huge opioid challenge that we're facing across the country, and then following that, Dr. O'Kane will discuss key areas of focus for opioid safety, and we'll target each of those summaries, summaries and excuse me, to summarize strategies to address opioid harms at work and at home. Um, she's going to use examples from all four of our states to highlight some best practices that are happening across the region. Dr. Reeves, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me fine. Uh, raise your hand if yep. you're having difficulties. Uh, I would like to start by talking about some of the key issues in safe medication use. We're focused today on opioids and the adverse effects of that group of drugs. But as Jennifer mentioned, we are attentive to a variety of medications that create harm uh, if not handled correctly. And so this is the beginning of a series that will address a variety of causes of harm, hospitalizations, and complications that can be uh, better addressed as we collaborate more effectively to improve outcomes. The types of adverse drug events that occur when opioids are used um, are direct threats to achieving the, the triple aim of improving patient quality of life and care outcomes. Um, Overdoses result in oversedation and can put someone to sleep and make them stop breathing. Um, the drug reactions can result in delirium, um, especially when they are mixed with other agents. Um, it's common for this to cause severe constipation, bowel obstruction, um, and, and is a, a very common side effect of, of opioids, even when they're used for correct conditions. And of course, we all are very aware of the severe uh, problem of addiction and substance abuse that is increasing in prevalence in our country. Let's go to the next slide. This group of drugs um, are a class that includes several agents that are legally prescribed for usually for pain management, but sometimes for other conditions. The issue is that not only illegally used heroin and, and those kinds of street drugs, but now extremely potent um, counterfeit drugs that include fentanyl and extremely high um, uh, impacts with it being a safety issue even for police officers who are arresting someone who has taken the drug, just a very minuscule amount, can actually damage the health of the police officer or uh, others around the person who's 
taking these extremely high dose or high high uh, intensity kinds of medications. As clinicians, we're more familiar with the uses of oxycontin, Vicodin, codeine, morphine, and fentanyl, both for anesthesia purposes, pain management purposes, and um, comfort um, for patients with both cancer and non-cancer chronic pain. But even when it's used by a doctor for the right um, reasons, um, it can lead to dependence and misuse with serious drug effects, including death. Naloxone is a drug that can reverse the effects of the opioids, and Nicole will get into more details of the effectiveness and the applications of those um, of, of that class of drugs uh, in a few minutes. Go to the next slide. The, the types of adverse effects that most commonly lead to death, hospitalization, and complications really are related to respiratory depression, where the patients breathe less frequently uh, and lower volume, are not getting enough air to actually aerate their, their, their blood, and the resulting impacts on the nervous system, including depressed mental status, um, and constriction of the pupils, and uh, as we talked about, bowel obstruction and, and, and stasis. Next, next slide. Risk factors that lead to opioid-related harms are in two main categories. One has to do with the adverse reactions of wrong doses, and the other has to do with addiction and, and dependence on these drugs. The kinds of patients who end up with the most adverse effects of those who start and stop. Um, it can be something where someone has started for an acute ankle injury or something that started as what should have been only a brief use for immediate control of pain, but they got some from somebody else or they indicated to their, their doctor or their clinician that they were having other pain and they wanted to have more medicine for that pain, and they stop and start it as the drug is available. Uh, and all, too often, these drugs are readily available in the medicine cabinets and the bathrooms of other family members that may have had it prescribed and have forgotten about it, but now younger people that are more sensitive to these impacts uh, get hooked um, uh, on this and become dependent. The other is they are commonly taken with um, uh, sedatives and um, such as Valium, with sleeping medications, with, with um, pain medications, anti-inflammatories, um, and, and these, this, this interaction of muscle relaxants, sedatives, and opioids is a terrible combination that results in a complex adverse reactions. It has, these have more impact on those who are over age 65, but as we'll see in a few minutes, the prevalence of the overuse and uh, adverse drug events also incur, occurs in our states in other age groups. Depression and anxiety are often concomitant uh, with the use of opioids and lead to increasing reports of pain that they request pain medicines for that really have mental health uh, origins more than actual measured uh, physical pain. The Addiction is, we, we will talk about in more detail, but it's, it's really a, a terrible event when it occurs in teenagers because science is now demonstrating that it programs the brain of uh, teenagers and young adults uh, into rewiring that can substance, substantially, substantially uh, change their likelihood of being able to um, stop using these drugs um, 
in later adulthood. Next slide. Can we go to the next slide? The, the increase in opioid-related deaths is significant. Um, the, the, every day, about 90 Americans die from overdoses of opioids. Between 2000 and 2015, the increase in the number of deaths per 100,000 was a tripling of the number of deaths from three deaths per 100,000 to more than 10 um, by 2015. I saw a slide the other day that looked at a graph of the number of spots that people report they have pain, the number of joints that they have pain on average per 100 patients sampled over this same period of years. And you could almost superimpose that graph on this graph. As people have more anxiety and depression, they perceive that they have more joints that hurt. They go to their doctor or their clinician for more pain meds, and the result is more opioid prescriptions, more complications, and more deaths from those opioid prescriptions. Next slide. You can see that the, the deaths are only a very small part of the total problem. For every one overdose death with 90 Americans per day uh, dying from opioids, 26 people go to an emergency department, 15 will be admitted to the hospital for addiction treatment, 115 will be diagnosed, will meet the diagnosis criteria for opioid use disorder, and more than 700 will be actually using opioids for non-medical reasons. This is an incredible catastrophe and epidemic that threatens our country. Let's go to the next slide. For our particular four states, we can see that the hospitalizations related to opioids are not purely among those over age 65. Oregon has seen a huge increase in hospitalizations for opioid treatment, for opioid complications uh, for those over age 65. But you can see that in New Mexico, that increase is more prevalent among young adults, same for Utah, and in Nevada, it is more increased for um, middle-aged and older workforce, um, mainly males, um, resulting often in suicides and, and other serious complications. Next slide. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that the economic burden just from prescription opioids, this is not heroin, street drugs, and, and other uh, opioids. This is from those that are prescribed, averages $320 per year for every adult American. Um, this, is a, this is a huge cost impact, um, as well as impacts on productivity, the law enforcement, addiction treatments, and, and health care. Let's go to the next slide. The causes that contribute to uses, excessive use of opioids includes, like we talked about earlier, depression, anxiety, often related to poverty, individual social isolation. Um, you would think with all of the Facebook and social media that people would be feeling more connected. But the truth is that the individual isolation has steadily worsened during the past decade. 
The other is that there's not very much understanding of what the adverse impacts and the important complications of opioids are, nor that there are many other treatments um, for pain that do not require um, opioids. So that improving our understanding of the social determinants, the behavioral health determinants um, that contribute, as well as improving screening and treatment and non-pharmaceutical treatments, if widely adopted, could substantially modify the prevalence of, of opioid misuse. Let's go to the next slide. The other is that going back to now about eight years or so ago, pain was perceived as the fifth vital sign. And patient satisfaction surveys that are used to rate physicians and more and more used to determine payments for clinicians became included in patient satisfaction surveys that are collated. And many physicians feel compelled to do whatever it takes to satisfy patients. If you're advising someone who is getting pain medicines that you're not going to provide them that pain medicine, you're not gonna get a high satisfaction rating for most likely when that patient fills out that survey. The early intervention or the, the early beginning of long acting opioids being widely adopted and widely promoted started with cancer pain, but then quickly moved over to patients that are, are not terminal patients and are not at end of life kinds of treatments. And at that time, um, the frequency of addiction and the estimates of how much things would improve were overestimated. There, the other is that we don't have good coordination, collaboration and integration of healthcare and coordination across sites of care and specialties of care. So often care is fragmented and doctors simply don't know what other doctors may have prescribed and what the patient may already have in their medicine cabinet at home. And uh, adding to that, it hasn't been easy to dispose of these medicines. So it's common for adults to have many medications prescribed, including opioids, months to years ago that are still sitting around the house for teenagers and others to access. Now that I've framed the, the problem and some of the causes, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. O'Kane to discuss um, possible solutions and next steps that, that can be considered. So I'll turn this over to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reeves. Uh, again, I'm Nicole O'Kane, and I really am interested in not only the, obviously, the overview of the problems, but what we're all here today is to begin to discuss solutions. We are not going to solve this problem today, uh, and we are definitely going to have to involve a lot of different people from a lot of different environments. And as we saw in the poll, there's a lot of people from different professions on the call today. So I'm a little bit interested in hearing the setting that you work in. Jen's going to launch a poll, and we're going to talk a little bit more about where you're working, where your environment is most likely to be impacted with some of these strategies and solutions. And then uh, from there, we'll go into a little bit more detail about um, some of the different areas of focus. Again, it looks like we have a nice balance of a lot of different um, people working from a lot of different environments, a lot of different work settings. We'll share the results of the poll uh, in the next minute or so. So, uh, so finish up that poll 
and it does help us to understand a little bit more about who's in the audience. I'm used to looking out and seeing your smiling faces and, and recognizing folks from different areas. So the webinar is a, is a unique challenge, and I appreciate you sharing who and where you are from. Right. I'm going to go ahead and now that you've all seen who you are, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Thank you again for sharing your information with us. So again, we talked a lot about the problems. It's complicated. There's a lot of different reasons why we've come to this place. The solutions, of course, will also have to be multifaceted. We'll have to consider and work across these different agencies. I'm sure that you've all heard about federal and state grants and initiatives that are happening in your state. And so today I really want to help activate you to go back and contact those folks to get involved in initiatives, to recognize what you're currently doing in your state and connect up to some of that work that's already happening. Um, we certainly have been more involved in connecting healthcare to law enforcement. As Dr. Reeves mentioned, there's a huge component around um, uh, the disposal of these medications, as well as coordinating when people come in and out of jail, what happens in that environment and do they have a safe place to go? Uh, do they have a setting that is supportive of that uh, addiction and recovery and that treatment? And of course, we have to involve patients and families. Each of us has a role to play. And if, if nothing else happens during this webinar, I would ask that you assess your own role really look at what you could do differently in your own workplace and of course at home as we start to talk about where these medicines are stored how we talk to our children about this horrible epidemic so as i alluded to coordination has to happen across these settings we're used to working within coordinating across healthcare, but in this environment we really need to be supporting health insurance, the payers have to be involved, how the coverage of the insurance for opioids and other treatments has to change. Legislative and law enforcement becomes a huge component as we change the laws around requiring uh, training, prescription drug monitoring programs, uh, whether law enforcement can carry naloxone. And another big component is the social support system, not only people from public health, but people that have been working in addictions and recovery for years, community centers that find a safe space where people can uh, interact with others in a sober environment, uh, making sure that there's, again, housing and support systems in place. Churches have a role to play. Um, lots of community efforts that are happening in the elderly happen around safe medication use and making sure everyone understands about the dangers and the problems that we have with this epidemic. So very complicated, but very important to coordinate. Uh, just a minute to talk about federal funding. Uh, there have been a lot of fed federal dollars that have come down to the states to help the states be more effective to address this. Um, in New Mexico, they've received um, uh, training and are expanding the role and the access to naloxone. In Oregon, we've been working across uh, the environment and uh, some of the work that I'll share with you is work that's happened at the Oregon level around how do we best target these dollars so that we're not only working with prescription drug monitoring programs, but some of these other aspects, some of the other components that cause this problem. So certainly the community, uh, the insurer, health systems, and making sure that we have systems in place electronically so that one hospital knows what's happening at another hospital. If someone's been discharged, um, they'd be able to connect that care uh, for physicians to understand who's, who's been treated for what. And then certainly a lot of state policies, what policies are driving um, solutions, and are there old policies that perhaps have some barriers that we need to change? A lot of work around rapid response and using data to evaluate what we're doing. Next slide. This comes from an overview of some great work that's happening in Oregon right now. I think it does a nice job of framing the issue. The, the issue is not to get people to stop prescribing opioids. What we want to do is make pain treatment safer. We want to make pain treatment more effective. And as Dr. Reeds 
alluded to, the opioids are not that effective for chronic pain, and there isn't a lot of evidence, and certainly a lot of evidence for their risk. So decreasing those harms, and then for people that are addicted or that are having problems, making sure there's support for them, uh, not only coverage for that support, but coordination for that care. A big component has to do with the number of pills that are already out there. How can we get rid of the supply of these dangerous medications? And, and then, of course, always using data because we want to make sure that we don't have more unintended consequences from our, from our compassion, from our need to try and help people that have pain. So making sure we're always tracking that data. This is the framework for the review that I'm going to do over the next 10 or 15 minutes. It also comes from work that was done in Oregon, but it very closely aligns with work that's happening in each of your states. What, we, what we've done is really looked at the drivers of this problem and really coming up with solutions where we know these are touch points, where we improve the area, we know that we'll have better outcomes. So as you're thinking about what you can do in your workplace and also what you can do at home, think about these different areas. Use this list as an assessment. Think about, you know, we, we have heard, and especially in healthcare, there have been a lot of focuses about safe prescribing practices. And certainly that's a component of this. But what about all the other things that work for chronic pain? Are we making sure that we have, that our patients have access, that they know about those treatments, um, that once you're, you need treatment, that there's access to uh, medication-assisted treatment, that naloxone is available for places and people that might have overdoses. Certainly, disposal and storage often gets forgotten, but it's a huge piece of, again, getting the pills off the street, getting the pills out of our medicine cabinets, and especially if they're not needed, uh, safe disposal and storage. And then as I mentioned, data is a huge component of this. This really has to be driven by data so that we don't have further unintended consequences. Next slide. For each of the areas of focus, and really much of the work that we all must do together, the work that Health Insight is working on now, is the primary role is really supporting professionals, whether there are electronic systems in place, whether they need training, whether there's uh, other staff that can help to provide that work rather than having physicians doing a lot of it. So a lot of system improvements. But if we only do that, we will not solve this problem. We have to involve patients. We have to help the public understand what's happening. And so much of this work in each of the six areas that I talk about, I always want to come back and remember, are my supporting the professionals? Am I involving the patient? And I'm, I'm informing the public and what's going on. So I'm curious out there in the audience, are you currently participating in any kind of an opioid safety initiative? Uh, go ahead and, Jen, I'll go ahead and launch this poll and just quickly let us know where you are. Do you feel like you've started on one of these areas of focus? Um, or is there uh, a group in the audience that really hasn't started yet? That definitely helps me to, um, to drive you to resources and things that will help you as you're moving forward. Again, what an interesting audience. It looks like as the first two polls, it's similar where we have a, a mix of more than half of folks really have are, and are involved with something. But we also have a good group of, looks like about a third of the group today hasn't yet been involved. So hopefully we'll get those folks activated to think more about what they can do. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. Next slide, Jen. So what I'm gonna do is just very briefly go through the six areas of focus. I want you to know that we'll, we've created a document that has lots of links to toolkits, to resources, to things that are happening in your community, in your state, because a lot of this work, as I said, has already been done and is being done. So we'll share that list of resources at the end. I'll go through this and most of the slides uh, will have some examples, but I don't want to spend too much time because I know we want to really get to questions and answers at the end and begin to engage on next steps. But I'm just going to take a few minutes to go through each of those six categories. As I said, safe prescribing strategies, we've, we've heard a lot about this, uh, prescription drug monitoring programs. Um, making sure that there's electronic systems in place across electronic health records. Training, 
certainly that first bullet point maybe has begun to happen around compassionate treatment that we want to make sure that we're not just telling people sorry you don't get your opioid prescription anymore but really helping them to maneuver through the system to help them understand if there's coverage for other treatments to help them with tapering and all this involves a lot of communication skills that none of us learned in pharmacy school in medical school and in nursing school so I would really encourage you all to engage with training there's an example at the bottom of the screen Nevada does project echo which I think a lot of you are familiar with uh, where we can, where you can uh, get on a webinar and and interact with professionals that have done this work before and ask questions and then be involved in case studies so all of those areas can help with safe prescribing and you've heard of the CDC guidelines. We'll include summary uh, information in the slides for you to review later, but some of these things that Dr. Reeves is already talking about, really looking at how you're using opioids, dosing of opioids, not getting people started, not letting them continue, really an expectation at the beginning of treatment. When I broke my foot last year, the orthopedic surgeon said to me, here's how it's gonna work, Nicole. This is gonna really hurt. We're gonna do the surgery. I expect for a week after that, you'll need these medications, but after that, we're not gonna use those medications anymore. Five to seven days, and I recognize it's gonna hurt, so we're also gonna work with some other components. You have access to my nurse. So it was really a well-rounded way for me to understand I'm not gonna be on these opioids 30 days later because that's where people get uh, stuck into this chronic condition. And then, of course, don't forget about naloxone. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Prescription drug monitoring programs. Each state has their own system. Most of you have probably heard of these um, monitoring programs. Uh, again, we'll provide links in the resources for each of your states. They look a little bit different in each state, and each state allows different things from the programs. But essentially what they help do is for all providers, pharmacists, nurses, you know, to be able to take a look, what did this patient receive before they showed up here today? And making sure that that care is coordinated. Um, don't forget that if you haven't visited your PDMP recently, it may have been updated and improved. All system improvements over the last couple years have not only made them more user friendly, allowing them to be integrated into your electronic health system, and certainly allowing chairmen across state lines so that I know in Nevada, you can, um, if, if along the California border, uh, there's some work being done to share that PDMP data across state lines. So also really important to coordinate that care. The next area of focus, I would say probably the most important because this one really gets underlooked, especially for the public, is there are lots of things that work to treat pain. It has to be a whole body, mind connection. We have to understand other mental health conditions. We have to recognize and acknowledge that these things work. There is good evidence, cognitive behavioral therapy, relaxation techniques, certainly exercise and movement, and a lot of folks are comfortable, and, and I've already done a lot of referral to physical therapy, occupational therapy, but some of these other areas, certainly massage, yoga, meditation has maybe until the last few years been left by the wayside. And I think the, the reinvigoration of this work, the re-emphasis that there's good evidence for this treatment, and I'm glad to see now that insurance is covering the programs um, so that people don't just have to rely on opioids, which is where I think physicians found themselves 10 years ago. There really wasn't anything else for them to do. Now there are lots of things that we can offer patients. Next slide. This is a good example of a community in Oregon that's come together in the Southern Oregon region, and they've really taken this whole system approach to helping their patients understand some of these other components um, in Southern Oregon, the uh, payers got together and, and really looked at how they would cover um, some of these treatments and communicate back to the providers how those treatments will be covered. Um, so making sure that everyone understands there are there is access to these other pieces rather than just uh, rely back on those opioids. 
medication assisted treatment. And we have to make sure for those folks that are already addicted and are already having problems with opioids that we provide them with access to the best evidence and the best treatment. And that is medication assisted treatment. SAMHSA has done a wonderful job and there's great resources on the SAMHSA website about how this works. Um, the good news is that now we're expanding and much of the state grants in your states and in mine in Oregon are involved in trying to expand the number of providers that offer medication assisted treatment. And remember that this isn't just treatment with medicine. It's a whole um, wraparound service that involves therapy, it involves uh, community-based support, and there are medications that are included. But this is greatly underutilized and, and the laws changed recently to allow nurse practitioners and physician assistants to also become uh, MAP providers. So please do look into this area if this is something that um, would impact your patient population. Who in your area can you refer patients to for MAP uh, services? Next slide. This is a good example in New Mexico. The HOPE initiative has actually been used and working on this for a few years. They're expanding providers uh, for medication-assisted treatment, and they have a great website where they're bringing this together, where we're not only talking about prevention, we're not only talking about protecting the public, but providing pr uh, people with treatment, with resources to access treatment, and resources to access recovery and, and that ongoing process. So lots of good uh, work that's been done and ways that you can connect back in your own state. Naloxone. Now remember, naloxone is the antidote. Uh, if everyone in the country was at high risk for an allergic reaction to bee stings, we would want to make sure everyone had epinephrine so that when they get stung by a bee, they have the antidote. And that's what naloxone is. It's not a, it's not a way to stigmatize people. It's not a way to say this physician is a problem uh, and has had a problem with prescribing. It's the antidote for people that are at risk. Not only if you're at risk for an overdose and some of the more traditional ways and way we think of an overdose, but now there's naloxone that's a nasal spray so that law enforcement uh, in New Mexico, law enforcement can now are now required to carry naloxone. Um, pharmacists in Oregon can now prescribe it. Uh, so again, in the past, naloxone was little used or it was used um, perhaps with the, in a community center where they were working with folks that had addiction issues. This is much broader than that. We want to make sure that folks in those settings have access. We want to make sure that uh, when a person is discharged from jail, that there's an opportunity and a conversation because as Dr. Reed said, um, after you've been, if you've been using opioids and you have a tolerance, but then you go off the opioid, when you are released from jail, that's the highest risk of overdose that you're gonna have. So involving law enforcement, making sure law enforcement has naloxone, um, and making sure that if you are caring for someone um, or if you have family members where you're concerned about the dose of medication, uh, the CDC guidelines do include that folks have access to naloxone for chronic pain treatment. So it really, it really is thinking of this as a way to have that antidote when you need it. So I have a question from Joan Hall, and she's referring to the previous slide. Yes. Um, she's asking, can you touch on that third point about NPs and PAs, please? Yes, yeah, really good question. So a question about the nurse practitioners and physician assistants. I would refer you, and again, we'll share the links to all these resources to the federal programs. The SAMHSA website has done a great job of not only describing what this looks like, helping nurse practitioners get the training that they need and get set up. Um, what I've been told is that it, it's overwhelming if you, if you haven't done something like this before, but once an, a, a, an individual practice, whether it's a small rural clinic or a larger health system, once they, they open the door and say, we're gonna do this, it really is not complicated at all. It really isn't any different than any other service that you're providing. So take a look at that SAMHSA website. That, those are federal laws, so that applies to all of our states. And then also within states um, to contact back to what's happening in the state because um, I know that there's some initiatives specific to the states that are help, helping to push out 
training and encourage training, especially in rural regions where there, we may not have access to that to those services. It's a good question. Uh, naloxone, this is a national uh, prescribed to prevent. Highly recommend this website. It was developed in the East and and uh, we also, of course, have some work going on in the in our western states around naloxone. But this is a nice one-stop shop to take a look at. How do I talk about naloxone? What are the risks? There's a lot of tools and materials there. So take a look at that. I also provided in the resource document uh, that we'll share at the end of the call and that will be on our website, state-based initiatives around naloxone. Because again, much of the federal dollars and those grants that came down to the states had to do with expanding access to naloxone. You know, the other good news about this community and connection is a lot of the payers uh, have changed their policies, um, removing prior authorizations for naloxone, making sure uh, pharmacies understand and have uh, inventory for the nasal naloxone or for the types of naloxone that, um, that the patients would be most likely to need. So uh, if you've tried to understand or figure out how to get naloxone in the past, and it was complicated, much of those barriers have been removed, and it, I'm, I'm guessing that it'll be quite a bit more streamlined than it was even two years ago. Safe storage and disposal. I do wanna spend a minute on this because I think this is a piece that gets overlooked. There's a, until 2014, it was almost impossible to get rid of your old medications. Uh, the DEA changed those laws, uh, again, we'll provide some links to the DEA website that, uh, that describes how this works. The new laws allow um, disposal sites to happen in a pharmacy. Um, again, there's some state-based laws that have taken this even farther, but essentially now clinics and pharmacies can sign up, have a receptacle that's not inside the pharmacy, but near the pharmacy window where um, a person could come in any time of the day. We don't have to wait for the Tate Fat program. I don't have to go to the sheriff's office, which that was available in the past, but it made it difficult for people to dispose of these medicines. So what I would ask you all to do is the next time you're in a pharmacy, ask your pharmacist, how do I dispose of this medicine when I'm done? Do you have information and material? Because the more that pharmacies hear that question and the more they realize that that becomes an expectation, the more they have engaged in this process. And certainly we've seen that in Oregon. Um, Utah has a nice disposal uh, website and a big public campaign to help talk to your patients about that. And what, you know, when Jerry, when Dr. Reeves talked at the beginning about the causes, one of the biggest causes is that people said, I didn't know these drugs were risky. I didn't know this was a problem. And you'll certainly hear stories where folks will say, um, you know, I keep the medicine in my medicine cabinet. And then, of course, teenagers can get into that. Uh, folks that are in recovery describe that they've, you know, certainly had access. So I would ask you to treat opioids like you treat a firearm. You don't want to leave it laying around the house. You want to leave it in a safe place, either locked or at least in a secure place where uh, no one else can get into it and you can monitor it. And then make sure that you have this conversation with your patients. Make sure that, um, that people know that these medicines are dangerous. Um, so I, I would appreciate certainly that you bring that and, and focus some of that in your own home as well. Uh, next slide. There are take back uh, programs twice a year. Uh, in no, on October 28th will be the next one. These are national takebacks. Uh, there's information on the DEA website about where you can locate those. A, a lot of the initiatives that are happening in the state are using this as a way to sort of reinvigorate safe disposal and storage. So do involve yourself and work during those takeback programs as well. Next slide. The last, certainly not the least, but data. Data is so important for all of this work. If we don't use data, we may have more unintended, unintended consequences. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, it's not just about prescribing opioids. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at prescribing, but um, looking at other, um, other components as well. What I have on the slide is an example. The state of Oregon has done a wonderful job of providing a dashboard. This is available to the public and to providers. You can look at a lot of different measures, everything from death 
rates in your county to prescribing um, to hospitalization. It, we also want to look at data that involves uh, naloxone. Who, where are there? Is there access to naloxone? Medication-assisted treatment. Is there one in in all the counties where we went? We need to make sure that happens. Um, certainly. Um, making sure that professionals feel supported with the data, whether that's data that's coming out of your electronic health record or whether that's data that's provided by a payer um, showing that your patients, that you have a certain panel of patients that are above a, a, a dose of morphine that, or an equivalent dose of morphine that we consider dangerous. So data, data, data can help us drive all of these interventions. And today, is if, if you weren't aware, today is International Overdose Awareness Day. Um, if you go to the website overdoseday.com, there's listings of um, literally hundreds of events happening all over the country. Most of these events are happening not in healthcare settings, but in community centers and in places uh, organized by family members that have been touched by this epidemic. So uh, do take a look at that Overdose Awareness Day. Um, and, and participate tonight if you can. Lots of information that I covered in a very short period of time. I've certainly gone to two-day uh, conferences on these topics, and, and we could spend a lot of time continuing to dive into this. But what really our purpose today was a call to action and to help you get involved and begin to connect with your communities, connect with things that are already happening in your state, and connect with Health Insight because we certainly can provide services and, and help you to connect if you have other questions. Um, here's the contact people for each of our states. Uh, we also have a, a medication safety website. Uh, that's where we'll store the slides for today. We'll also have resources available. Uh, as I keep mentioning, we have a nice resource document where you can go to websites and um, training and information that's available. And I, I believe Tyler is going to share that yeah. Um, that link with you now. So the direct link isn't working, but I did share the um, Health Insights Opioids website, okay. which is it's linked there. Okay. Um, so go ahead and take a look at that website. And again, if you for whatever reason can't find that or don't have access to it, or right now you're on the phone, um, contact back with your uh, connection at Health Insight. Uh, and that those contact numbers and emails are listed on the slides and we'll make sure that we can connect you with, uh, with services and things that are happening in your area. So, um, there you go. So I think we want to take some time for questions and discussion, but I really, um, I, we have about, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes. Again, this is a beginning place to start. Uh, let us know where we can help you next. Tyler, you, I suspect you have some good questions. Yeah, so there has actually been a lot of discussion on the chat about alternative treatments um, because people seem to think that uh, prescribers are not highly likely to prescribe them. Mm -hmm. um, also, somebody commented and said, patients get upset if you don't give them what they need. Yep. They don't want the ancillary test. They threaten the personnel and physicians. Yeah. Somebody else said, uh, our biggest problem by far is the patients inherited by newer providers who have for long years been on pain pills and are convinced that these are necessary for day-to-day -day living. They are very reluctant to change and try other inter interventions. They are bitter when the new PCP is trying to cut down or stop their pain pills. This is complicated by the idea that they should never have to experience any pain. Yes. It's an interesting... Uh, dilemma that we've put ourselves in where and Dr. Reeves mentioned this at the beginning somehow the idea that the human body should exist without any aches or pains and that somehow our mental anguish and our frustration with life is somehow separated from my lower back pain because we know that they're connected and what I would what I would say related to the uh, concerns with patients Lots of good training and resources around having difficult conversations. The Oregon Pain Guidance website um, has listed and working with social workers. So a, a primary care provider can't and shouldn't have to have this conversation in isolation. It's a multidisciplinary approach. Just like when we treat a patient for diabetes, 
it's not all on the primary care provider. We need you know, social workers, we need connections back to dietitians, and that's the same model. And um, so a, a pitch for our, uh, uh, our annual quality conference coming up in October, uh, we are doing some sessions on, uh, in Oregon at the Oregon conference on the non-opioid treatments for pain. But I, I know this is difficult, and I think the, be, the place to start is to begin to take it out of the hands of one individual person and begin to put it into a team-based care and to, to train all your staff around those difficult conversations because I would be frustrated and angry too if I thought one thing was going to happen and now something different's happening and I'm afraid. And so people act out of, out of fear. Um, Dr. Reeves, did you want to comment any, anything about those, you know, related to patient fears and that they, perhaps they don't want to even think about um, getting anything else besides their opioids? Yes, this is Jerry Reeves. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I was just at a meeting, a large meeting, of the State Medical Association for Nevada, where physicians were speaking of some of these experiences. And the carry home message um, was that really patients seek first to know whether you really understand what they are dealing with. And a lot of the interventions might be summed up by our getting better at active listening, actively understanding, and, and compassion for the patient and what the scenario is. Most of these patients do not inherently want to be on a drug that makes them constipated, sleepy, and have a hard time um, breathing. That's, that's not, they're not desiring that. What they are desiring is relief from discomfort and anxiety. And I think that pill passing is not the best solution to those source um, uh, issues. So I think that as we work together at developing solutions, working on patient doctor communication and team communication, active listening, and motivational interviewing. Um, to really address the unmet needs of the patients where they are at giving them uh, alternatives that are their idea is really a key intervention strategy. Yeah, I would say yes. You know, and certainly when we look at uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and work that's been done um, either in, in collaboration with the primary care provider where they're, they're referring to and being part of that team effort, and then also back to some of these other community programs, the uh, Oregon Pain Guidance that I mentioned, the work being done in Southern Oregon, they have um, classes that people can participate in to help learn about um, pain, uh, to learn about uh, relaxation techniques. And there, we've heard uh, from lots and lots and lots of people that will, as patients, that will tell us I didn't think I was going to be able to do this, but I feel so much better. And I can't believe that I used to feel like this when I was on opioids. And now I do this and this and this, and I feel so much better. I've gotten my life back. So involving patients and also having patients as testimony. When you're doing this work, making sure that physicians can not only hear from patients that are struggling, but hearing from patients that have found some solutions and bringing those patients together in a group setting. So again, just like diabetes, very overwhelming for a person who's just been diagnosed with diabetes, having them in a group setting with folks that have been really able to manage their diabetes really helps everyone. It helps the person who's doing well to sort of reconfirm their new life, and it helps that person who hasn't yet started down that long road to see that, in fact, they can do it. Right. Thank you, everyone, for this great conversation and for the information. Thank you to Drs. Reeves and O'Kane. Um, we do have an evaluation, and it will be posted here shortly in the chat. Um, we would ask that you go there and fill it out. And um, if you would like to um, send additional questions to any of the contacts you see listed on the slide, please feel free to do that. We can access. Um, the experts you've heard here today 
And again, the slides will be posted on that website. Apologies for the technical difficulties. I think that is Murphy's Law. It had to happen, and so there you go. Uh, again, thank you all very much for your time, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.